All right, so hopefully you can, you can still hear me. Uh, hello, hello everyone, my name is Philip Babich, as you know, uh, and today I'll be talking about building asynchronous mechanisms using Kotlin coroutines in Android, which is a bit of a mouthful, but basically I'll be talking about the following things. Um, I'll talk about why you should use coroutines in uh, Android or why you should consider them if you're not using them already. I'll also talk about coroutines in general, so what they are, how they work, what's suspending uh, functions versus blocking, uh, and how can you how you can implement coroutines in your Android apps. Through some few, through like a few examples of actual custom APIs uh, or building your custom uh, containers for coroutine lifecycles and so on and so forth, uh, where I'll kind of pivot into what effective usage of coroutines is or how you can use the best practices to follow and improve your code base in terms of coroutines. And over through, throughout all that, I'll kind of talk about the internal works and just in general, uh, how coroutines operate and why they are a bit more performant than some of the other solutions. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're thinking about using coroutines and you're not using them already, or you've just recently started integrating them, uh, you're probably moving away from Rx or something similar or callbacks. Um, as opposed to Rx and callbacks, coroutines provide a very clear and easy to understand syntax, uh, which is very understandable, very intuitive, very, uh, let's say, basic in terms of how you write it. It doesn't require a lot of complex operators. It doesn't require a lot of complex callbacks and mechanisms. While it still handles all the asynchronous work um, that you have to do in a very performant way, which is very performant out of the box. So you don't really have to worry about threading or uh, managing your own thread pools. You don't have to worry about handling a lot of the thread switching and handling a lot of the exception handling and all of the other internal works because coroutines are made to be very easy to use and very simple to learn. Now, it, they are not as simple in terms of how they operate internally, but they are much simpler than let's say Rx and like just going through the brunt of the Rx documentation to understand how the very basics work. Um, coroutines are in, <clears throat> in fact very integrated into the Android ecosystem and it's very easy to start using them. Uh, and it's very hard to mess up, so to say. So you're not going to run into the situation where you're just like randomly blocking or freezing the threads because the way coroutines work is uh, to avoid doing all of that. So we'll kind of go through that in a minute. So it solves all the problems as Rx, as callbacks and other types of mechanisms while still being very straightforward and not really complex to understand. Um, so what are coroutines in general as a term, as a Computer science, uh, computer science, the thing that happens within uh, our processes uh, uh, through our applications and all that. Well, it's a very fairly old concept dating back to the 60s, uh, essentially. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and a coroutine is essentially a special kind of a system routine or a subroutine, which can be suspended and resumed. And all routines are basically functions. So there are some kinds of operations that the system has to run to achieve some type of work. The thing about coroutines is that they can run in parallel with other routines, uh, which gives the name coroutine. Instead of uh, basic routines, which are very uh, straightforward, you run them, they have to finish, and then you can proceed with other routines. So in a simplified diagram, if you were to look at this, a subroutine or a system routine would have this kind of life cycle, very simplified, obviously. So you start a routine, you call a function, such as the main function, it calls all the functions within it, all the logic that you have to um, implement in your application, your main function. It finishes that logic, and when you return from the main function or when the last statement is, is done, you end the program and you've, you're pretty much done. So that's kind of how the basic life cycle of a basic routine is. In terms of coroutines or how a sub subroutine or routine life cycle works when you have coroutines, you launch that routine, uh, you start some work, uh, and essentially it's going to finish and uh, end the program, right? But in the middle, what you can do is you can start any number of coroutines, which can then suspend. They can wait for a while before they are finished. They can uh, do some work before they return a result. And only after all the ru uh, routines, which are coroutines are finished, does this subroutine finish too, uh, or the system routine. So essentially what, ha what happens here, you can run parallel work instead of just a single run this, run that uh, type of uh, code. You can run something and that code can run a bunch of other functions as well. And all of those functions, once they are finished, sometimes in the future, um, through parallel, parallel work, they finish together and then the entire program can finish. 
So again, it's not nothing really special. It's just a way to, to create subroutines or routines in general that can be paused and resumed at any point in time, more or less. So in the API itself, in the coroutines API uh, in Kotlin, you have a few important concepts. First off, you have uh, a few important functions that are call, called coroutine builders. Um, obviously, they build coroutines and they generally return a job or they return a value. So you have the launch builder, which launches a new coroutine. It does some work and returns a job, which is a piece of work that you can cancel. So uh, similar to Rx, how you create a subscription and you get a disposable or something like that, which you can cancel, uh, you can do the same with coroutines. There's also an advanced builder, which is called async and await. Um, that returns a deferred value, which is also a job that can be canceled. So the deferred value is essentially like a future or a promise in some languages such as JavaScript or, I guess, Dart or C Sharp. So these types of builders are really good when you want to create a bunch of uh, values or a bunch of jobs that can run, and you need to fetch their result or compute their results sometimes later in the code. And finally, if you want to have something that's very straightforward, that produces a value and suspends um, while the rest of the coroutine can do whatever it needs, you can use the with context builder, which essentially just returns a value in a separate thread in a different context. Speaking of context and threads, uh, there are three other very important concepts in terms of coroutines. The first is the coroutine scope. So it defines the life cycle of the component that um, you use to start and essentially confine coroutines into a small box. The scope, acts like a box that you can cancel all of the jobs in. So you can shut down the entire scope. Uh, so for example, similar to the lifecycle of uh, the Android applications, you can shut down the entire lifecycle and all of the coroutines within will also shut down. So the, the idea of a scope is that you never run a coroutine that has no lifecycle and that is going to leak any kind of uh, memory or operations into the system. You have the coroutine context as well, which defines a context or environment of the coroutine, similar to what the context in Android does. So it has a, it's a set of a few unique elements, such as the lifecycle, which um, is defined again through the coroutine scope as well, the exception handling through an exception handler for coroutines, that is one of the elements that you can define, and finally the threading mechanism where you can essentially define what type of, types of threads you want to use within the context, uh, what type of uh, you know communication you want. Do you want to, this to be communicated on the main thread, on the background thread, or essentially wherever the, the coordinate is being called? And finally, you have the suspend modifier or generally the suspend concept. In Kotlin coordinates, it is a compile time modifier that marks when a function can, uh, that a function can be su suspended. And when you call these functions, it also marks um, in the Android Studio in your ID, it also marks uh, in the actual runtime that this function is going to take some time to be finished and the rest of the core team can move on. So how does this actually work um, together? So here's a very simple example, uh, something that you're probably not going to write uh, uh, too many times, but you have a global scope that represents the scope of the core team that you're going to launch. Uh, the global scope is tied to the app lifecycle, so it's the largest scope of uh, a quality that you can have. Um, you have other examples of lifecycles that we'll get to, such as the actual lifecycle scope uh, of the Android activity or fragment. You also have the scope of a view model if you're using view models. And all of these scopes define how long the quality can live uh, before it's uh, essentially destroyed or uh, shut down in the process. You use the launch uh, block or, or the launch uh, coroutine builder to create a new coroutine. You pass a new context in. Uh, the context here is just a dispatcher's main, which is one of the <clears throat> context elements that define the thread. So dispatchers define the threading of a coroutine. In this case, we are using the main thread to compute this work. Um, and you can combine this dispatcher with a few other types of contacts, such as the as I mentioned, the coroutine uh, exception handler, as well as uh, the job or the life cycle of the coroutine. You do some work with using the with context function, but in here in the with context, you pa uh, pass in the context of the IO dispatcher. So what's going to happen here is that with context is going to suspend, it's going to shift to the background thread, it's going to run some work uh, using the get user ID function, and after it's done, it's going to bring back this uh, main dispatcher coroutine and it's going to print that user ID. Uh, 
So this creates this concept of suspending versus blocking. And this is the real power behind coroutines. So usually when you have a regular function, such as let's say do heavy work, which computes some expensive result, when we call that get expensive result function, it's going to block this function, it's going to block whatever thread we're calling this in until the value is actually ready. So once the value is ready, we can continue with the is valid check and then finally do some work or show an error. If we just change this to be a suspend function instead, and the get expensive result function is operated by a with, with context block, which means it's also a suspend function. What's going to happen here is that we're going to run get expensive result, is going to suspend its parent, which is potentially like a launch block or uh, an async block or something like that. So that's main thread that we used previously in the example is going to be freed up because the coroutine within that main thread is suspended. It has to wait for this expensive result, which means that you're not going to block your main thread. It's, you, it's actually going to compute the result in the background. And once that result in the background in a separate thread is ready for you, we can continue with the rest of the work and act like nothing happened, essentially. So what's really cool here is that we have an asynchronous operation, something that's heavy to, uh, to work through and something that's really hard to produce, but it's not actu actually blocking the main thread, even though we are using the main main dispatcher, which is really cool. So that's the idea of coroutines. That's why when you call a uh, coroutine in the view model scope, which has the main thread dispatcher as its default, and when you create expensive operations there through, let's say, retrofit or, or room that we'll get around to later in the presentation, you're not blocking the thread. You're essentially suspending the uh, coroutine, the, the launch block until the data is ready. And by then the main thread can do whatever work it needs to. And finally, once the data is ready, you can start doing uh, your, your work through UI updates. So now that we've gone through that, we can <clears throat> discuss how coroutines can be implemented in Android. So here's a bit of a disclaimer. Um, most of this presentation is going to talk about how you can do things yourself. But right after that, I'm actually going to, to present a solution of how you can do it without any kind of effort. So again, this presentation is about building uh, your own APIs, about combining coroutines in your uh, code. If you don't really want to use, let's say, the standard ways of doing things, such as or relying on third-party libraries. But then I'm going to show you how the third-party party libraries handle this, how, how much less code it is, while still keeping a lot of this uh, functionality together so you don't have to worry about it. So that's just a small disclaimer, uh, again, to understand uh, what the presentation is about. So again, as we mentioned, to start a coroutine, we need the scope to define a lifecycle. We need the context to define some of the rules. And finally, we need a coroutine builder. So let's create this in uh, our own base presenter or something like this. Um, obviously, if, it, if it, you can use something like a composition or something like that instead of like deep inheritance, then that's obviously much better. But for the sake of argument, we're going to use the very simple um, approach here, which is not relying on any kinds of field models, on any kind of external structures. We're going to try and create everything ourselves. So this presenter essentially represents uh, one of our communication parts within the view layer and the business logic layer. It also has any type of data that you can su support. And it has a bunch of properties here that we define for coroutines. So first, we defined uh, the view so we can communicate the result to. Um, we defined a few jobs or coroutine context. So the jobs here is going to be a list of the work that we're currently running. That's going to be really useful because we can dispose it later on, similar to what a disposable bag does. Uh, we can override the coroutine context here so that the presenter that uh, implements the coroutine scope interface for the lifecycle can essentially provide this to all of our, um, all of our coroutines. By default, this coroutine context is going to be dispatcher's main and is going to be combined with our coroutine exception handler that we can define somewhere later um, or so somewhere else in the presenter. So the idea here is that by combining the main dispatcher with the exception handler, we create a combined context of two elements or two rules. First is everything or every coroutine that's launched in the presenter is going to be uh, main first. And the second is that every uh, coroutine that we launch in the presenter is going to use the coroutine exception handler that we defined to catch all the exceptions. Finally, we have two functions uh, to trigger the cleanup of this presenter. So we can clean up all of the jobs by canceling them. So if the job is currently active, 
we can cancel it and that's pretty much it. And finally, we can clear all the jobs so that we dispose of them uh, essentially. So this is all pretty straightforward. Now, in terms of the actual code that we need to run, or let's say, uh, how do we launch coroutines here? Uh, we can take a look at this function, which is process re registration with some registration data. First off, we create a new job and we add it to our disposal bag by launching on the, on the presenter. What's really cool here is we just call launch. So we have the coroutine scope implemented in our presenter. We have the main dispatcher as the default. So whatever work we do here is going to be done on the main thread but it's going to be suspended in case we want to shift to other threads, such as fetching some data from the IO dispatcher using the register user function or something like that, or like a use case that we have within an async block. We first create a deferred value here, and then we add that job also to, uh, to the jobs uh, disposal back. So in this case, we are sure that we control how this uh, work is being uh, done, obviously, and what its life cycle is. So in case we want to cancel the presenter, we're going to clean up both of these operations. So uh, in terms of the result itself, once the, we await for the result, um, we can check if the value is a successful result or a failure, and essentially show some data to the user, such as you register successfully, or show an error saying, hey, your password is incorrect, or not incorrect, but too short, or your email is invalid or something like that. So th this is everything that we need to do in terms of like creating our own API. Um, it's very simple, very straightforward. It doesn't take too much work, but it's also a bit bulky because you have to handle the jobs. You have to handle the cancellation logic. You have to implement the quoting context and all of this kind of clutters your business logic. So you can obviously go to this extent and create like a base presenter and just inherit the, the behavior. But again, you should always try to favor composition over, uh, over inheritance. And you should always try to kind of delegate some of the work uh, to, to other uh, libraries that have proven solved solutions if you can, I guess. So uh, in, in case of Android, uh, some of the libraries that we have here are actually embedded within the Android ecosystem. So we can implement the or use the dependency for the lifecycle view model KTX and some other dependencies for coroutines basically to create this. So here we just create a user view model that has some kind of a repository or something to, to fetch the data from. And it extends from the view model class. We extend from the view model because the view model has something really important to us, which is the view model scope. Um, this view model scope creates its own uh, context similar to what we had before. And it also creates its own cancellation logic through the onclear method in, in the view model, which is really great. So we, now we no longer have to control uh, or create a quality scope ourselves. We don't have to create a quality context. And finally, we don't have to worry about the coroutines being cleaned up once the view model is destroyed. In terms of the logic, all we have to do is actually call view model scope launch. So it's not as, um, as clean, I would say, as like just calling launch uh, from anywhere, but it's also much more intuitive, I would say, or much more clear where you're uh, binding the core teams to. Because just calling launch in a presenter, it's may maybe not as clear that you're also implementing the core team scope. Uh, in here, we know that we are la launching a core team within the view model. So when the view model dies, it's also going to be canceled. And in terms of work, we can just say, uh, let's fetch some data from the repository. It can be a suspend function. And then we can do whatever checks we need, such as like creating a success, or a failure result and then checking its data. So this is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It's very, very short code. It's very understandable and everything looks sequential. So that's kind of the idea of coroutines that you have all this complex, all this stable and clear and you know really strong uh, set of tools at your disposal, but the code doesn't have to be super complex or super, super hard to understand. It, you don't have to read like, 50 pages of Rx operators and documentation to understand what's going on. You can just, as I mentioned, launch a coroutine within the view model scope and fetch some data. How simple is that? So we're going to take another example here of how this um, fetch fetching of data operation might work and how you can build your own APIs to support generic retrofit calls. So what we want to do here in this example is to map from the retrofit response that we get such as like a call or some some data in general, uh, something that's uh, that's parsing uh, parsed from JSON, uh, 
to map it to a domain model. And then finally, also add the functionality of error handling between the, the you know, API calls and operations, and also retry logic to try to fetch the data a couple of times before failing in case we are um, dealing with a network exception or something like that. So to do that, we'll first define a very, uh, very strange looking uh, generic function. So we're going to create a mappable interface uh, that essentially maps the value from uh, the domain, or sorry, the, the JSON result model to a domain model. So for example, from the user response to a user model, um, we're going to create a get result function that uh, is an extension on the call type from retrofit. So essentially we're going to create a function that is going to take the call from the user response and transform it into a result of a user. This result can be uh, either a success if we manage to get the data, parse it correctly, and it has all the uh, required uh, properties that it needs, or it's going to be a failure result in case there's an exception, something that not going to be parsed correctly, or there's something missing. So for example, um, for a user, you might require the user ID. So if the user ID is missing, obviously you can return a failure case. <clears throat> So the next part of the logic of our get result block is going to be to wrap the call and the parsing logic. So here, here we have the call wrapper lambda function that takes uh, any kind of operation that we want and it returns a result of that type that we need. Um, it first clones the retrofit call so that we can call it multiple times in case something fails. And then it tries to parse the results by executing the <clears throat> sorry, executing the actual call, and then finally fetching the result uh, through the response body if it exists, and mapping it to the uh, success class through the map mapping function, which is uh, based on the, the mappable interface. And finally, it uh, tries to fetch the error result in case uh, the error body mapping uh, or the uh, mapping of the body doesn't work, or we have to fetch the error body or something like that or it just provides a failure with a null pointer exception that says, okay, there's no data available, we didn't manage to do anything, here's your error. So in case we do uh, catch an error or a trouble, we're just going to print it or return an error uh, failure case based on the error type. Once we have that, we're going to pro create like a data provider function that again uh, is a suspendable function that returns this result. Um, we're going to create a suspend coroutine here um, this is another coroutine builder that's a bit more advanced. So essentially, suspend coroutine creates a new coroutine and it gives you the continuation object. The continuation object is a low level callback for the system where you can just present some data and it's going to push it up the stream of the coroutine. So just think of it like a small callback and you don't have to worry about the rest. So in here, we create the data, uh, the data, the call wrapper that we need. We try to fetch it. We have some extra logic such as delays if we need it, uh, such as um, parsing the extra logic, uh, ex the data through some extra logic, uh, checking some extra properties, logging the data or something like that. And finally, finally, we resume the coroutine with that given data. So what's going to happen here again is we're going to try to fetch the data and if it doesn't work, if something crashes, like there's a crash, there's a parsing error, we're going to use the try catch block to push the failure of the result instead. Now we have to define an invalidator for the data. So something that's going to take our result and see if it's valid or not, uh, or if it's invalid actually. In this case, we just check if we reached a failure case or if we, um, if we reached a network or a server uh, error exception. We try to repeat a few times uh, after we uh, define this uh, validator, we try to repeat the call a few times. So what we do here is we provide the data we invalidate it to see if it's okay or not. If it's not, we proceed. If it if it is okay, we return the data. Once we proceed, we delay uh, for a repeat or to like have something like an exponential delay or something like that, retry logic. We delay the coroutine, so it's going to pause, it's going to free up the thread, and finally, it's going to fetch the data again. If it doesn't work for a number of times, we finally try to fetch the data again, uh, one final attempt, and then we return the data. So all of this generic stuff, all of this logic, uh, I'm kind of like big on generics, so I really like them. Um, all of this creates a very simple result for us where we can say API service get game details, for example, or get, get user profile. 
which returns a call for that um, response model. And we just say get result and it returns a domain model for us or a failure case in, if, in case something doesn't work. So that's pretty much it. We can define all of this behavior, all, all of this logic in a very clear and very straightforward way. But again, we're kind of like just talking about a single call here. So let's take a look at how we can effectively call uh, coroutines, what we can do with them and how we can effectively like create um, APIs that work and that are, that are very clean. So when we were using the async block or we were using the async blocks before, we were just creating an async block and then awaiting for it right away. That's not actually like the best way to use async blocks. So <clears throat> what happens with an async block is that it creates a new coroutine it runs the code within the async block. So you're computing the value already, but until you call await, you don't suspend the parent coroutine. So the correct way of using async blocks is actually to chain them together into multiple blocks. You start multiple operations in parallel, and then you await in one spot or um, essentially await uh, at the end of your code to fetch all of the data and then finally produce the end result. So in terms of like our logic here, um, if we were to use something like this, um, something like this uh, combined with our get result logic, what we can do is we can say something like this. So we can say, oh, sorry, get use the user profile with the given user ID. It's going to reduce uh, all of these operations to a single user profile that we can use. Um, and it's supposed to be a suspend function, that's a typo. So it's going to create three async blocks using the IO dispatcher. So the get result function that we have, the, the huge generic function that we have is going to run on an IO thread. So it's going, going to execute the call there. And that's why you can use execute instead of NQ. We can fetch the user ID, uh, sorry, the user by ID. We can fetch all of its posts. So from this user and all of their future posts as well. Um, so, Essentially, we fetch these three types of uh, uh, data or pieces of data, and we combine them all together into a single async block at the end, uh, or sorry, a single await block at the end that produces a user profile. So this is a really good way to combine multiple data operations that want, that you want to run in parallel, and then finally return a single value. And all, you can do all of this within a function without like really creating any kinds of callbacks, switching multiple threads or something like that. All you need to do is make sure that this is a suspend function because of the await, uh, await function. So yeah, async and await is best used for like multiple operations, for uh, all parallel operations that you want to uh, fetch multiple values and combine them together. If you're looking into more straightforward examples of just like a single value, then you should use with context. So in this case, we will have something like this. We will have a get user profile function in our repository, for example, or API service um, that uses the with context block to switch to the IO dispatchers. And it's going to be a suspend function. So it just returns uh, the value from the API service uh, that also obviously uses the get result um, function. So what happens here is you call with context in a suspend function um, in a coroutine and it suspends that coroutine. Um, the with context block essentially compute some value. And then once it's done, you get to consume that value and you end your code, you end your program, which is really good. So it's a way, it's the best way to bridge between between threads and sync up the end async work. So if you need to combine multiple things, you can just use a with context block, sync up between two threads, and then use that value to something else. Um, it executes that block of code, as I mentioned here, and it uses the dispatcher that we pass in as the way to produce a thread or the way to use a thread pool so you don't have to block the main thread. So uh, it's actually going to return that value to the call site using the original dispatcher. So it shifts to a different dispatcher while it's computing the value and then it goes back and returns to your original dispatcher in case our, um, in our case, the main dispatcher, the main thread. So in terms of like optimizing and cleaning up your code or how you can do that, um, essentially how you can do that in your application, how you can approach building coroutines and using some of the best practices. Let's take a look at a few examples. So one of the things that you need to think about when creating coroutines is that you should definitely try to decouple the responsibility for coroutines. So we had this example of a presenter holding all this logic, all this responsibility, 
Uh, and we'll kind of try to see if that actually makes sense or if that's something that we should do uh, initially, or that's some, like a really good approach. We're also going to take talk about, or we talked about using the builders effectively and how you can abstract away context by pushing it downstream. Uh, and finally, I'll chat a bit about the, the exceptions and how you can return results or why that's like, that's a best practice. So as, as we mentioned, uh, coroutines are like a, you know, there's a lot of code that, um, runs behind coroutines in terms of like the life cycle, the cancellation, um, error handling, and so on and so forth. So in the first example of our presenter, we decided to build everything ourselves and push it at the business logic layer. But that is essentially wrong. You should try to decouple your responsibility for your uh, business logic. So in this case, let's say we're using a view model. The view model shouldn't really know what's going on with coroutines. It shouldn't really know that it's actually using coroutines or that it's doing this like complex um, operation switching uh, or complex way of like switching between threads, combining them together, um, having to use like a spe specific context or something like that. What should, you should actually try to do is push it towards a use case or like the, the uh, domain side, which is the repository or the entity. So the repository should be responsible of providing the data and providing uh, suspend functions, just clear suspend functions that give this data to you or give this um, operation uh, capability to you without actually you know, letting you know that in which thread is uh, going to perform the operation, what kind of like extra complex logic is handling behind the scenes. So this is very straightforward. This is the repository pattern. Um, what's really good here is that you should use the entity part of it, which is the API or the database to effectively promote even more decoupling. So the repository itself also doesn't have to know much about the threading uh, capabilities. It doesn't have to know if it's, uh, if you're trying to switch operations or something like that, unless you absolutely have to like switch and run multiple things in parallel, then it can be, uh, then you can provide like a abstract coroutine or coroutine context wrapper that you can use. So let's take a look at what this means. So as we mentioned, we're using the, the thread pools for coroutines uh, that are provided within our dispatcher. So we can either use the IO thread pool for, um, from the IO dispatcher, or we can use the default pool, which uh, is very similar to the IO dispatcher, but has like a separate pool potentially based on your CPU architecture. So. The idea here is that the repository and everything looks very, sequ very sequential, very non-asynchronous while you're still dealing with asynchronous operations. So again, um, even though you can do a lot of logic yourself, even though you can build all these complex APIs such as we did for the retrofit, sometimes it's actually better to uh, rely on pre-built mechanisms by uh, other people. So in this case, we can take a look at room integrations with coroutines um, and also retrofit. So, what you can do in Room is you can just mark off your functions uh, as suspend <clears throat> in the in your DAOs that you define for your database. Uh, and what's going to happen here is that these operations are going to be pushed to the background thread. So Room is going to generate code using the suspend modifier that creates a coroutine that uh, uses respective coroutine builders, creates its own or has its own coroutine context, has its own lifecycle, and handles all of these operations for you. So it handles the cancellation, it handles the um, possibility of like switching to the background thread, so you don't have to worry about it. It handles all of these things for you, and all you actually have to do is just say, uh, use my uh, user DAO and give me this, um, give me this uh, object, give me this user object, insert this operation, or uh, give me a set of values from a specific table. This is very straightforward, very simple, and effectively it makes you not have to worry about any of the operations in Room. So you don't have to create any kind of logic for Room to get a result to fetch this uh, like generic type of data. With Retrofit, actually, uh, as well as with Room, as I mentioned, uh, it kind of works the same way. So by adding the suspend modifier to your Retrofit function, which would usually return a call or some kind of like a special wrapper object or a result. What you can actually do here is you can just slap on the suspend modifier to the retrofit function. And instead of returning a wrapper of the data, you just return the data directly. So again, what's going to happen here is that retrofit and uh, all of the 
internal OKK HTTP logic is going to be generated in a way that it handles all the operations for you, such as cancellations, such as um, in case like any exceptions happen, retry logic, delay logic, all that. And it's also going to um, you know automatically parse the data uh, through your obviously parser. So if you're using something like Moshi or something like that, so it's going to combine all of these operations together with a simple modifier so you can get the data directly. And again, no longer you have to do any kind of get result operations or try and catch blocks with like huge um, amounts of boilerplate. All you have to do is just uh, potentially pr provide your own um, exception handling if you want to like parse the exceptions uh, in a nice way. Or you can just uh, provide a coordinating exception handler that handles all of the exceptions and gives you a way to propagate all the errors to a single place. So as I mentioned, now that we have these suspend modifiers, we don't have to build any logic around it. We don't have to build any kind of extra uh, you know, use cases, any kinds of extra ex exception handlers if we don't have to. And it kind of makes it seem like none of the things can crash, everything is going to work correctly, right? Well, it's again, not, not really the case. So there are again, two ways to handle these exceptions, even though there are some like built-in ones, but you should consider adding a try-catch block either way. Um, if you're just looking to parse your, uh, your errors or your exceptions into like a domain exception that gives you an information that you can show to the user. Um, you can also build the coordinate exception handler as an automatic interceptor and add it to your coordinating context within the view model. So it's going to be very easy, very clean, um, and it's going to be very straightforward. Everything is going to be automatic. So the, uh, the life cycle of the coordinates is going to be handled by the view model. The life cycle and the background threading is going to be handled by the API or the retrofit and, uh, and uh, room uh, operations. So you don't have to worry about that. And the exception handler is going to catch any exceptions that you might not have. Um, handled yourself using a try catch block. So everything is very automatic and everything is very, very uh, like clean and agnostic. So through these mechanisms, as I, as I mentioned, um, using coroutines, you can build very complex solutions that where you have a lot of control, where you have all the control of the operations, all of the control uh, of the life cycle, of the cancellation, of the exceptions. But at, in the end, you don't really have to do that. It's not something that you have to worry about because most of these solu solutions such as Room, such as Retrofit, work out of the box for you. Um, what you can do uh, is combine coroutines through, let's say, if you really want to have like, um, you know, UI that's being observed and react is reactive, you can add an extra layer of flows or uh, states if you're using Compose, and that can serve as a reactive outlet to your uh, imperative and synchro synchronous and, well, asynchronous, but sequential operations. So if you're looking into more resources on how you can build all this, I would definitely suggest our book, uh, Kotlin Coroutines by Tutorials, that I'll mention in a moment as well. But there are really awesome tutorials in terms of like using Groom, using Coroutines uh, with it, and using Retrofit and Coroutines with it, as well as how you can combine Coroutines in multiple places in Android, such as the work manager, such as um, just in general Jetpack tools, such as the view model, the life cycle, um, the view life cycle uh, that is living within the um, activity or fragments and services in general. So there's a bunch of ways you can use coroutines in Android right now if you're not using them already. So be sure to check out those resources. And as I mentioned, we have this book, Kotlin Coroutines by Tutorial, that um, Nishant and I wrote a couple of, a couple of years back. Um, it's currently being updated. So we're going to work on the third version of this book. Uh, we have this uh, version to write uh, that, that's out right now. So make sure to check it out on the raywendel.com website. Um, you can use the, the slides for the link. Um, and one of the great things about the book is if you buy it digitally, so if you, can, if you want to read it uh, on an iPad or something like that, or your computer, uh, you're going to receive future updates for the book too. So essentially, as soon as we publish the next release, you're going to receive that which, with a bunch of new useful examples, a bunch of projects that we worked on, and a lot of the in-depth core explanation that we didn't get around to today. So thank you for listening. And are there any questions? Uh, I imagine there are on the talk thing, but let me see um, if I can like log into that. Because it didn't really work for me a, a while ago.